Welcome back to this lecture series about the general linear model. Today we continue with another advanced topic, which is Advanced Analysis of Variance, or ANOVA. Let's recap our knowledge of ANOVA. ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance, and I've explained in a previous lecture that a one-way ANOVA has one categorical predictor and a continuous outcome, and provides us with an overall test of any differences between group means. This is also called an omnibus test. By default, the null hypothesis of this omnibus test is typically that all of the means are the same. So we can write this as H null is that the mu of group one is equal to the mu of group two, is equal to the mu of group three, etc., etc., until we reach the mu of group k, where we assume that there are k groups. And the implicit alternative hypothesis, h sub 1, is that the null hypothesis is not true. So any of these means differ from each other. So let's consider an applied example that is close to my heart. A study on whether using climber's chalk improves your grip on the holds. So many climbers use a product called chalk, which is actually magnesium carbonate, to dry their hands when they climb. And it is true that climbing chalk absorbs moisture, it is what we call hygroscopic, but that doesn't automatically mean that it also improves climbing performance. In fact, the assumption that using chalk improves climbing performance is largely untested. So here's a study going back to 2010, where the authors conclude that chalk dries the skin, decreasing its compliance, and hence reducing the coefficient of friction. Secondly, chalk creates a slippery granular layer. Alternative methods for drying the fingers are preferable. So these authors argue that chalk makes the skin less pliable and therefore a bit more smooth on the rock, and that the chalk works kind of like a ball bearing, creating a layer between the hold and the hand, also reducing friction. So they say that it would be better to just wipe your hands on your shirt, for example. So, I created a fake data set based on this published study, and in our data the dependent variable is how long participants were able to hang in a controlled setting until they fell down, so until failure, in seconds, and the predictor or independent variable is the method with which they dried their hands. So they either used nothing, or they wiped on their t-shirt, or they used chalk powder, or a chalk ball, or something called liquid chalk, which is fine particles of chalk in suspension in alcohol. So we can code the categorical predictor in different ways. This is the familiar dummy coding scheme. There we pick one reference category. In this case, the reference category is using nothing. So I chose this reference category because it seemed like a sensible control condition for me. And then you create k minus one dummy variables where k is the total number of groups. And these dummy variables indicate membership of one of the other groups that are not the reference category. So we see that there are five groups and four dummy variables. One group is the reference category and people who are in the reference category score zero on all of the dummies. And then there is a dummy that codes for whether you were in the t-shirt condition or not, and a dummy that codes for whether you were in the chalk ball condition or not, and a dummy that codes for using chalk powder or not, and a dummy for whether you used liquid chalk or not. As we've covered in previous lectures, you could conduct linear regression with dummy variables, where you represent a categorical variable with k categories in a regression model using k minus one dummies. And then we have the following parameters. We have an intercept A, and that is the mean value of hang time for participants who used nothing, so for the reference category. And then we have several slopes, B1, B2, B3, and B4, that tell us the difference between the reference category and the category coded for by the dummy that that slope belongs to. So for example, in this model, B sub 1 tells us the mean difference between the group that used nothing and the group that wiped on their t-shirt and B sub 2 tells us the difference between the group that did nothing and the group that used the chalk ball, etc. 
So here is some example output from that linear regression. So we see that the mean hang time in seconds in the group that did nothing was about 23 seconds. And we also see that the effect of wiping on a t-shirt was 10.5. So that means that people who wiped on their t-shirt were able to hang on average about 10.5 seconds longer than people who did nothing. And here we see that people who used a chalk ball were able to hang on average 1.16 seconds longer than people who did nothing. And for people who used chalk powder or liquid chalk, the difference was actually negative. Um, so people who used chalk powder on average were able to hang 0.5 seconds shorter than people who used nothing. And people who used liquid chalk were able to hang on average 0.3 seconds shorter than people who use nothing. We also get some t-tests for the significance of these parameters. So this first t-test tells us whether the group who used nothing was able to hang on average significantly more than zero seconds because the implicit null hypothesis being tested here is that this parameter is equal to zero. So that's not the case, they hang longer, so we get a significant t-test. And then all of these other t-tests test for the significance of the mean difference between the reference category and the category coded for by that dummy variable. So for example, we had seen that people who wiped on their shirt on average were able to hang 10 seconds longer. And this is a test for whether that difference is significantly different from zero. And we see that it is significantly different from zero. And we also see that none of the other differences between these three groups and the reference group, none of those differences are significantly different from zero. So this is pretty interesting and it seems to be a reasonably good fit for this study on the effect of climbing chalk. One group is clearly the reference category and we can just compare each of the other groups to that reference category and it tells us if you want to be able to hang longer, you probably should wipe on your shirt. But there are a bunch of other questions that remain unanswered here. And we can actually use the same model, but with different coding schemes for our categorical variable to answer those questions. So let's have a look at alternative coding schemes. One alternative coding scheme you've already seen in passing, and that is the ANOVA specification of the model. So instead of including one intercept and k minus one dummy variables, it is also possible to include k dummy variables, so one dummy for every group, and not include an intercept. If you want to do that, you code your variables as follows. So note that we now get five dummy variables for five categories, and every category has one dummy variable that is encoded with a value of one if a person is in that category and is encoded with the value zero in every other case. So if we look at this regression formula, we now see that the intercept is gone and we just have slopes for every single dummy variable. So compare this, there are five slopes and five dummy variables. To this, there is one intercept and then four slopes and four dummy variables. In other words, we've replaced the intercept with one more dummy. The total number of parameters is the same. Previously, we had one intercept and four dummies, and now we have five dummies. So the model is going to be mathematically identical, but it's going to give us slightly different parameter values. Let's have a look at that. So in the ANOVA specification, each regression slope is going to give us the mean value of the category encoded by that dummy variable. So B sub one is going to be the mean value of the do nothing group. And B sub two is going to be the mean value of the t-shirt group. And B sub three is going to be the mean value of the chalk ball group, etc. Both of these models are mathematically identical the only thing we did is we replaced the intercept with one additional dummy variable. They have the same number of parameters. 
And the advantage of using ANOVA specification instead of regression specification is that we can now get a standard error for each group's mean. And that means we can perform custom hypothesis tests for every mean against particular hypothesized values. So for example, if you're an Olympic trainer and you want to know which of these methods of drying the hands is going to allow you to break a world record, you could perform custom hypothesis tests comparing each of these values against the current world record, for example. Remember that the default t-test in most statistical software tests a zero null hypothesis. So in regression, it tests the hypothesis that the parameter is equal to zero. And if you want to test against a different value, you're going to need a standard error. So you can use the standard errors obtained from this ANOVA specification to test against any other hypothesized value. So here is some example outputs from the same model, but with ANOVA specification. Note that now we get the mean for every group. And the first mean should be the same as the intercept from our previous regression model. Let's quickly compare that. Yes, it's the same. And the mean of the t-shirt condition is 10 point something seconds higher than the mean of the nothing condition. That's also correct. And we can see that it corresponds exactly to the same picture. But importantly, here we get a standard error for all of these means. And then these are the t values testing whether each of those means are equal to zero or not. But we could use this standard error to test against any other value that we want to hypothesize. So for example, let's assume that the record of hanging at my gym is 30 seconds. I might want to perform a hypothesis test whether hang time in the t-shirt condition exceeds 30 seconds or not. So in this case, it's a one-sided hypothesis. So my null hypothesis is what I'm trying to reject, is that the parameter is smaller than 30. And my alternative hypothesis is that hang time is equal to or larger than 30. I can calculate the t-statistic by taking the observed mean, 33.66, minus the hypothesized mean of 30, and dividing that by the standard error I found in this output table. So this is going to be 3.66 divided by 2.62. That's going to be slightly larger than 1. In fact, it's 1.4. And then I can use a table to look up a critical value for the t-distribution. In this case, I have 84 degrees of freedom. And remember that the degrees of freedom for these t-tests are the number of participants minus the number of parameters. I have five parameters, so I must have had 89 participants to begin with. So I can look up the critical value for a one-sided t-test with an alpha of 0.05 in a distribution with 84 degrees of freedom. And that critical value is 1.66. So here I see that my test statistic of 1.4 is smaller than the critical value of 1.66. So I cannot reject the null hypothesis. So hang time in a t-shirt condition does not significantly exceed 30 seconds. So now we've looked at dummy coding and ANOVA coding, but there are even more coding schemes. So in dummy coding, we get k minus one dummies plus an intercept. This gives us the group mean plus significance tests for the difference with all other group means. You've also seen ANOVA dummy coding where we get k dummy variables for k categories, and this gives us all of the group means, and we can perform significance tests comparing those group means against any value we want. But here are several other coding schemes that represent exactly the same information, but present the results in a different way. First is deviation coding. This form of coding compares the mean of each group against the overall mean of the sample. Second is contrast coding. This allows us to compare the mean of several groups combined against the mean of several other groups combined. So for example, this would allow us to compare one control condition against two different experimental conditions to answer the research question, is there a significant difference between the control condition and the experimental conditions, plural? 
or it could allow us to compare, for example, the effect of two positive emotions versus three negative emotions. And when we use these different coding schemes, we'll talk about indicator variables instead of dummy variables. So we only call an indicator variable a dummy variable if it is one hot encoded. That means it has a value of one for one category and a value zero for all other categories. If it's coded in a different way, we'll just call it an indicator variable. The general rules for coding schemes are as follows. For all coding schemes, it must be the case that the possible values of every indicator add up to zero, and each group should be uniquely identified by a particular combination of the indicator variables. This is, for example, why we cannot have both an intercept and a dummy for the reference category. The dummy variable and the intercept are completely redundant in that case. So that is why when we compared the dummy variable specification against the ANOVA specification, we could exchange the intercept for an additional dummy, but we cannot include both an additional dummy and an intercept. And a final consideration for these coding schemes is that sometimes you will have to account for the relative group size, and we'll get into that later. First, let's get into effects coding. Effects coding allows us to compare the means of all groups to the grand mean of the sample. In this case, all we have to do is make sure that the reference category no longer scores zero on all indicator variables, but instead receives a negative value. If all of the groups are exactly the same size, in other words, if we have a balanced research design, then this value is simply minus one, and the codes for each indicator must add to zero. That means that, for example, this first indicator, it codes for whether or not you are in the t-shirt group. If you are in the t-shirt group, you should get the value one because added to the minus one, that sums to zero. So they cancel each other out. So in a balanced design, this is the coding scheme for effects coding. The reference category gets a minus one on every indicator and for example, this first indicator codes for membership of the t-shirt group and people in the t-shirt group get a plus one. And this second indicator codes for membership of the chalkball group and people who use the chalkball get a one for that indicator. Effects coding gives us the following information. It gives us the grand mean for the dependent variable. In other words, what was the average value across the whole sample? And it gives us the difference between each group except the reference category relative to the grand mean. But there's a problem. In real life research, we rarely have balanced designs. Very often there is a slight difference in the number of participants between groups. And in this case, we can use a more general method to create our effects coding, which accounts for differences in sample size. We simply assign different weights to the reference category for every indicator. Imagine we've conducted an experiment with three groups, and the first group has a size of 44 participants, the second has a size of 87 participants, and the third one a size of only seven participants. We certainly wanna use weighted effects coding. So for three groups, we're going to get two indicator variables. The first indicator is going to tell us whether a person is in group A or not, the second indicator is going to tell us whether a person is in group B or not, and that makes group C the reference category. So for indicator E1, the weights for group C are going to be calculated by taking minus one times the number of people that are in the category coded for by E1, so that's group A, 44 people in group A, so minus one times 44, divided by the number of people in the reference category, group C. So the weight for E1, for people who are in group C, is going to be minus 44 divided by seven. And by the same logic for people who are in group C on variable E2, we're going to take minus 87 divided by seven. So at this moment, you're probably thinking, I can calculate this, but I don't understand it. Well, let's go back to the example with 
equal group sizes, and maybe that will help you understand. So note that when the group sizes are equal, this formula simplifies to minus one for the reference category. So imagine that instead these three groups were all 40 participants large. Then for our first indicator variable, E1, which encodes for whether people are in group A or not, if you are in group A, you score a value one, and if you are in group B, you score a zero, and if you are in group C, you score minus one times the number of participants in the group that this variable codes for, which is 40, so minus one times 40, divided by the number of participants in the reference category, which is also 40. So we get minus 40 divided by 40 is minus one. And then this coding scheme simplifies to this coding scheme. So let's apply weighted effects coding to our climbing chalk example. We have the following sample sizes. There were 24 people in the do nothing condition, 13 in the t-shirt condition, 23 in the chalk ball condition, 16 in the chalk powder condition, and 13 in the liquid chalk condition. So we have our four indicator variables, and each indicator variable codes for membership of one of these four groups, which makes the do nothing category the reference category. And then for each indicator variable, the weight assigned to the do nothing category is going to be minus one times the number of people in that group. So here E1 codes for whether you're in the liquid chalk group or not. There are 13 people in the liquid chalk group. So minus one times 13 divided by the number of people in the reference category, which is 24. So the weight here is going to be minus 13 divided by 24. And we apply that for all of the indicator variables. If we use this coding scheme and we conduct our regression analysis, these are the results that we get. The intercept is the grand mean of hang time across the entire sample. And the slopes for each of the dummy variables are now the mean difference between that grand mean and the specific category coded for by that indicator variable. So people in the t-shirt conditions were able to hang 8.8 .8 seconds longer on average than the sample average. And people who were using a chalk ball were able to hang minus 0.5 seconds shorter than the total sample average. So that covers effects coding, but there's another coding scheme and that is contrast coding. Contrast coding allows us to compare groups of means against each other. For example, someone who really believes in the effectiveness of chalk may want to compare the two conditions that did not use chalk against the three conditions that did use chalk. So we might ask, is there a significant difference between doing nothing or using your t-shirt versus using any of the three chalk methods? So the null hypothesis here is the mean of doing nothing or using your shirt is the same as the mean of using powder, a ball, or liquid chalk. And we could additionally ask questions such as, is there a difference between liquid chalk and any of the dry forms of chalk, etc. Remember that there are certain rules that the coding schemes must adhere to, so we have to create a complete coding matrix. And this is pretty tricky, pretty advanced, so I imagine that any time you will do this in the future, you will have the reading material for this week closely at hand when you do. So if we want to use contrast coding, we're going to go through several steps. The first step is you plan all of the contrasts that you want to test. This scheme must meet all of the requirements. Remember that these are the requirements of the coding schemes. The possible values for each indicator should sum to one. Each group should be uniquely identified and sometimes you have to account for relative group size. So let's have a look at this coding scheme. What contrasts does it calculate? Well, the first contrast is do nothing or wipe on your shirt versus any type of chalk. And then if you do nothing or if you wipe on your shirt, you are assigned a value of minus 1.5. And if you use a chalk ball, you are assigned a value one. If you use chalk powder, you are assigned a value one. And if you use liquid chalk, you use a value one. 
Notice that taken together, these values sum to zero, which was one of the requirements. So minus one plus minus one is minus three, plus one is minus two, plus one is minus one, plus one is zero. So together, these two groups perfectly balance out these three groups. And then we have another indicator that tests for the contrast between doing nothing or wiping on your shirt. So minus one for doing nothing and plus one for using the shirt. We have another indicator testing the difference between using dry and liquid chalk. So if you use a chalk ball, you get minus 0.5. If you use chalk powder, you get minus 0.5. And if you use liquid chalk, you get plus one. And we have one final indicator coding for the difference between bowl and powder. The second step is that we have to account for group size. If you don't do this, if you skip this step, instead of comparing the means of groups of groups, you will be comparing the means of the means of those groups. So you would be testing whether the mean of doing nothing plus the mean of shirt divided by two is the same as the mean of using powder plus the mean of using a ball plus the mean of using liquid divided by three. In other words, you would be testing the unweighted mean of the two groups against the unweighted mean of the other three groups. If we do account for group size, then you are comparing the mean value of those multiple conditions. So the weighted mean of doing nothing or using your shirt versus the weighted mean of using powder, a ball, or liquid chalk. However, if the group sizes are equal, then both of these approaches are identical and you could just skip accounting for group size. How do we account for group size? Well, each contrast has two sides. And on those two sides, you have to divide the number of participants in that one category by the total of participants on that side of the contrast. So on this contrast, we're comparing people who did nothing or use their t-shirt against people who used any of the forms of chalk. So to calculate the weight for doing nothing, we take the number of participants who did nothing and divide it by the total number of participants on this side of the contrast. So the people who used either nothing or a shirt. And we do the same for the shirt participants, and we do the same for the chalk ball participants, and the chalk powder participants, and the liquid chalk participants. And notice that these values must be negative, and these values may be positive. Notice that if there's only one group on each side of the contrast, we can still just use minus one and plus one, because this group do nothing consists of 24 participants, and we would divide that by the total number of participants on that side of the contrast, which is 24. 24 divided by 24 is 1. The third step gets a little uncomfortable, because now we have to do some matrix algebra. A little disclaimer, matrix algebra is not part of this course, so I'm not going to explain what it means to invert a matrix. I'm just going to show you how to do it, and that's actually not so hard. So the first step, step 3a, is to copy-paste this table of contrasts that you just created into either Excel or Google Sheets. So notice that these are the same contrast values that I just calculated, only converted to decimal numbers rather than fractions. The second step, step 3b, is to add a column of intercepts. And this column of intercepts should have the value 1 divided by k for each of the groups. So in this case, we had five groups. So our intercept is going to be one divided by five or 0.2. So we just add a column in front of everything with 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, etc. Then the third step, step 3C, is to copy paste this formula. Click an empty cell somewhere in your spreadsheet and paste the formula m inverse of the transpose of, and then you select your contrast matrix. So you select everything here from the first cell to cell E5, and then you finish your formula by typing these two closing brackets. And as soon as you hit enter, you get this inverted matrix. So it's pretty simple. These are the values that you're going to use for your indicator variables.
So this is your new coding scheme. Notice that you can forget about the intercept column, so you only need these four columns to have your coding scheme. When we code our indicator variables with these values and then perform our multiple regression analysis, we get these results. So here we get a significance test for the difference of the mean of people who did nothing or used their shirt versus the people who used any type of chalk. And the mean difference between those two groups of groups is minus 3.4. And that is not significant. There is a significant difference between using nothing or using a shirt, which we had already seen, and that is significant. And there is a small negative difference between using dry versus liquid chalk, and that is not significant. And there is a small negative difference between using the ball versus using loose powder, and that is also not significant. So notice that this contrast coding allows us to answer much more complex questions about groups of different treatments, which can be really useful in some study designs. The final technique that I want to explain are so-called post hoc tests. Post hoc tests are basically a way of saying, I compared the means of all of the different groups against each other. So if we have k groups, that means we can make k times k minus 1 divided by 2 total comparisons. So for 5 groups, we can make 5 times 4 divided by 2 is 10 unique comparisons of group means. Historically, this is called a post hoc test. Post hoc means after the fact. And that reflects the common practice that researchers would first look at the omnibus test of the ANOVA see if there were any significant differences between groups, and then use post hoc tests to see which groups were significantly different from each other. Post hoc also implies that this type of test was most often not hypothesized beforehand, like a planned contrast would likely be, for example. So when you use this technique, you have to be very conscious of data dredging looking for positive findings in your data sets, because that increases the risk of finding false positive results. You can only get post hoc tests in SPSS via the ANOVA interface or by manually changing the reference category to be each of your groups in turn when using the regression interface. But that's just a lot of work. So for this purpose, use the ANOVA interface. When we consider the risk of data dredging, it's important to keep in mind the so-called experiment-wise type 1 error. Remember that the significance level alpha is the probability of committing a type 1 error in one single test. We typically use alpha of 0.01, so a 5% probability of drawing a false positive conclusion. But when we conduct many tests, we run that 5% risk every single time, and those risks compound. That's what the experiment-wise type 1 error encapsulates. It's the total risk of committing at least one type 1 error across all of the tests that we've conducted. So we write this as alpha sub EW, the experiment-wise type 1 error risk, across multiple M tests. And we can actually calculate how big this risk is because the experiment-wise alpha level is 1 minus 1 minus alpha to the power of m. So if we conduct 10 tests, the experiment-wise alpha level would be 1 minus 1 minus 0 0.05 to the power 10 comes down to 0.4. So for 10 tests, we have a 40% chance that there is at least one false positive conclusion drawn. And that might be more than we want. So how can we prevent that? Well, the simplest way to do this is by using what's called the Bonferroni correction. And Bonferroni correction is simply taking the experiment-wise desired alpha level and dividing it by the number of tests. So if we want to maintain a 0.05 alpha level across the whole experiment, 
then we divide that 0 0.05 by the total number of tests to get the individual alpha level we should use for every individual test. The problem with the Bonferroni correction is that it's very conservative. That means that it becomes much harder to detect a true effect, even though we are able to control the false positive rate. And there's always this trade-off. If we want fewer false positive conclusions, that means it becomes harder to detect true effects. And if we're focused on detecting true effects, it becomes more likely that we observe false positive results. So there's always a trade-off between one or the other. There are a lot of other ways to control your type 1 error rate, but some of them are a little bit outdated or don't generalize beyond ANOVA. Nowadays, a more common statistical technique to control the type 1 error rate is to use something called regularization, which is not part of this course because it falls within the domain of machine learning. But there's another solution, which is methodological, and that is to just plan your hypotheses beforehand. And you can pre-register them to show the world that these were the hypotheses that you plan to test. And then it's not so risky to use the conventional 0.05 alpha level or to pick another reasonable alpha level like 0.01. So here's a link to Daniel Laken's book on performing better statistical inferences with a chapter on pre-registration. Pre-registration is what we call an open science practice and it just means publicly announcing what hypotheses you intend to test before you've seen the data. And this is one simple methodological way to prevent data dredging. That's all of the material for this week. Good luck with the tutorials and see you next week.